Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone, on a Monday evening. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, discussing the Blessed Virgin Mary and Palamism. Um, in particular, hopefully, the Immaculate Conception and different issues related to Gregory Palamas and his theology on the essence and energies distinction. Uh, joined by Eric Ibarra, Roman Catholic, William Albrecht, also Roman Catholic, and an Eastern Catholic, Dr. Jared Goff. Dr. Goff, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's been busy. Uh, yeah. Lots of lots of piano going on in my household with my kids, but other than that, okay. you know, we've got some projects uh, coming yeah. to publication that I've been working on. So, yeah, things okay. are going well. What, so, well. what's the what's the next book coming out? Well, uh, you know, a couple. I just had an article published in uh, one of the medieval uh, Franciscan volumes for Brill mm. on uh, Bonaventure's sermons on the Annunciation. It's a it's a mm. fairly substantial article. Uh, Father Christian also has uh, a piece in that on Francis Mayrones. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, you know, we're happy to have that come out. And then also a couple of items, um, you know, I've been working on with uh, the uh, conventional Franciscan Father Wayne Hellman, um, a translation of Bonaventure's Treatise on the Theological Virtues from uh, the third book of his sentence commentaries. That's almost finished. And a couple of other items. Uh, the first volume of Father Peter Fellner's collected essays is going to go to press this month sometime. And that's particularly dealing with his writings on Marian metaphysics. And then finally, his last great work, um, Theologian of Auschwitz, St. Maximilian Kolbe and the Immaculate Conception in the Life of the Church uh, will be published uh, probably at the end of this month. And, and uh, he finished that back in 2000 probably 15, 16, and then we had to spend a couple of years editing uh, the text and getting it ready ready for publication. And uh, sadly, uh, he didn't live to see its publication, but hopefully he will uh, is still living to experience and recognize some of the fruits of that publication. Excellent. And so we're very excited. It's a big, you know, 400 page volume, uh, yeah. tracing out basically all the, uh, all the sources and, um, ramifications and impl implications of uh, St. Maximilian Colby's uh, Marian theology mm. rooted in the, especially the Bonaventurian uh, Scotistic uh, metaphysical and theological school. So it's, it's quite a work. It's, it's a, it's his kind of gr last great work. And it, you know, it's fitting that it was his last because I, it probably is his greatest work. So we're excited to see that. So look out for that text. Excellent. Yeah, sounds like a lot of good stuff coming out. So let me ask you about the Immaculate Conception, because I know this is an area that you've studied a lot, um, especially as you are very familiar with the works of Duns Scotus. So here's one of the things that I'm trying to understand. I understand that um, many in the East have used the Greek term pro catharthesa um, which from what I understand is loosely translated as pre-purified. Now, here's one of the things that I'm trying to understand. When Eastern fathers, say from Gregory on down, use the term pro are they, the definition that they're attributing to it, does it um, basically mean that there is no way that she, the Blessed Virgin Mary, could have ever been devoid of sanctifying grace, that there was never a time in which she could not have um, enjoyed the divinizing energies of God? Or does that term not necessarily address the moment of her conception and maybe leaves room open to say that perhaps she was subject uh, to sin in some kind of passive way and was on, under the domain of Satan in some kind of way. So can you maybe help me understand that term? What exactly does it mean? And how do we know it means what what you say it means? Well, goodness, uh, you know, I think you're gonna have Father Christian on here and he's really the expert on uh, the um, the etymology and development of the use of that term. But as, as I understand it, um, when you get to a figure like um, St. Uh, Gregory Nazianzen, um, and later uh, writers, authors like John of Damascus and later Polemite authors. Um, what you have here is, is basically the assumption that, of course, Mary is all, all, pure, all pure, all holy. And this is something that defines her person by virtue of which, um, <clears throat> or for the sake of which, uh, she is all holy in order to be precisely the mother of God. Uh, so in, in a sense, her person is oriented towards uh, becoming or being Theotokos. And so in the most perfect sense, uh, she's going to 
have the effects of of this grace in order to render her perfectly fit. I think um, there is there. So the, so the assumption is is Mary is all holy. Um, but how literal and to what extent do we take this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you see in a, a kind of multiple lines of development by the time you arrive at Palamas, mm -hmm. and even before that with the Damascene, you have multiple lines converging. You have the um, the notion of the, the, the primary ratio of creation being Christ, the incarnation, as both the, the perfect ad extra term of God's um, love and creative powers and potentialities. So in, in this sense, you see uh, a foreshadowing of Scotus's uh, argument for the absolute predestination of Christ, irregardless of any conditions. This is the purpose for which God created, because God is love. God is the most orderly <laughs> will willer. Um, that which is best or most lovable, he, he wills first. So in the order of intention, Christ is the final cause of creation, and thus he's the first as the intended um, <clears throat> work of that creation. Well, with 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 Palamas, you have then, and, and especially you see this in Mark of Ephesus, you have also this notion, and it's also in the Franciscan school with uh, Bonaventure and Scotus, you have this notion that um, there is this sense in which Christ was predestined, essentially, not in, according to a, an absolute necessity of nature, but according to the fitting will of God, uh, so that there can be this full typological, anti-typological, capitulative, recapitulative structure between the first creation and the second creation. You have an essentially ordered will on the part of God that um, Christ would become incarnate through a woman and through a woman virginally. And so <clears throat> by dint of this close association, what Latin scholastics will call the order of the hypostatic union, um, she is absolutely predestined in uno eodemque de credo, as Pius IX will argue or explain in, um, in Ineffabilis Deus, uh, that she is, in a sense, co-predestined in this one order as the full anti-typological and recapitulation of the first creation. So you have, you have the, the, the woman and the man and the, the man coming from the woman. Um, <clears throat> so in this sense, then, she's then associated with this order of intentionality that links her and primarily places her under the moral headship of Christ rather than the moral headship of Adam because of her place with respect to the first term of, or the first term and intention of God's will to create ad extra. So she then becomes kind of a co-ratio of creation as such because she is created to be the mother of God. And so in this sense, you see a development and a recognition that uh, Mary is all holy. But when you're when you're dealing with Saint Gregory Nazianzus, there seems to be a common assumption of her all holiness, and you see this repeated and developed, um, or her immaculate existence, her absolutely pure existence, her perfect existence. You see this developed from Gregory through um, figures like Sophronius, uh, especially Saint John of Damascus, and later when you get into uh, Saint Gregory Palamas and Mark of Ephesus, you see this logic being applied. But the problem is, and what you, you raise an important point, is that even in the West, of course. The issue of exactly when she was she was rendered perfect or all holy uh, is not specifically addressed because um, the issue of raising questions about the moment of her sanctification, well, this this was in a sense correlated to the arise or the rising of the celebra celebration of the conception of Saint Anne. So okay, so since we're now celebrating this feast, it could be just like another John the Baptist because we celebrate the conception of John the Baptist in the East, or it could be something different. Mm -hmm. And so Gregory, Gregory Nazianzus's logic is the association of the ritual pur purification in Luke chapter 2, associating Jesus with Mary and seeing a univocal kind of uh, purification going on. Mary's more associated with Jesus in this purification. So there must be an analogical notion of purification. And Ulteriorly, in the Eastern tradition, especially with some somebody like uh, uh, Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite, you see, um, and this is something taken up by uh, and exploited by uh, Saint Gregory Palamas, but also to a lesser extent, um, because uh, Bonaventure in the in the West, because Bonaventure never arrived at an affirmation of the Immaculate Conception. Nevertheless, uh, we understand from a common uh, usage or application of the Dionysian notion of the three uh the the um the ways of, pur of purification of spiritual development the the purgative way the illuminative way and the perfective way okay and so this notion of purification is implied to angels well angels clearly had no sin but yet they're still spoken of as being purified 
And both Christ and Mary are recognized by Dionysius to be superior. And this is something common to the Eastern tradition and the Western tradition. So if they're superior to the angels in their grace and sanctity, yet the angels can be purified. Well, by a similar use, a kind of quasi-angelic use or analogical use of this notion of purification, well, so can Mary be purified, not in the sense of from sin, but in the sense of rendering her more fit throughout the course of her life to eventually give birth to the whole Christ, head and members. And so there are these moments of grace, these punctuated moments of grace, wherein the Holy Spirit overshadows her, she's filled with the Holy Spirit, or she's purified or pre-purified, that actually sets the condition along the stages of the way towards the fullness of this fructification of <clears throat> her uh, divine maternity through the actual giving birth of the God-man from her own substance, as St. John of Damascus says, you know, from her own most pure uh, blood. So I think um, <clears throat> even though you don't find uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus using or applying the Dionysian notion of purification, even with respect to angels, to Christ and to Mary, by the time you get to, say, Mark of Ephesus and St. Gregory Palamas, you see, ah, yeah, now they're kind of bringing the two strands together, and there is uh, a precedent for understanding purification, not primarily or exclusively as purification from sin, but purification insofar as there is this further progression um, that doesn't imply any prior sin. It's just actually a further rendering fit, a kind of hierarchizing of the soul um, to uh, manifest uh, God's purposes, to also redound in terms of the perfect or more, more, more intense sanctification and glorification of whatever agent or object that is under consideration. So I think, I think that's important. And, and you see an interesting parallel developing in the Western tradition uh, by use of the Dionysian uh, triple way in, in somebody like St. Bonaventure. Because actually what St. Bonaventure uses is he applies uh, a kind of analogical. He has the triple way for the fallen program and he has a triple way for the unfallen program. And by he, he can only include this triple way um, for the unfallen with respect to the angels. But when you get later on with Scotus, when he resolves the question of what can justify the Immaculate Conception, how do we explain this theologically in virtue of Christ, Mary's need for some form of redemption, analogically, and ultimately some form of theosis beyond just um, nature, but actually salvation in its proper sense, uh, we'll find that this notion of purification in the, in the uh, Scotistic tradition, especially beginning with somebody like St. Francis, May, I mean, it's not St. Francis, but Francis Mayrones, uh, they will use Dionysian categories again to apply to um, the Virgin Mary. And what's interesting here is that in the order of execution for the fallen, you begin with what? The three virtues. Three, you begin with faith, hope, charity. That's the typical ordering, right? But in terms of the, the, the triple way, actually, the first stage is purification, then illumination, then perfection. But, but what is fascinating here is that purification precedes illumination. But purification is rendered or appropriated to the virtue of hope, properly speaking. So in this notion of the Dionysian hierarchization, this angelic um, stages of divinization, you can have an angel created in a state of, of, of innocence then moving to greater states of sanctification. And this notion is through per purification appropriated to the virtue of hope. So in a sense, Mary could have this process of purification, under, undergo this process of purification, even as unfallen. And through this process of purification, mean, meaning rendering her more fit to understand, have her mind illumined by the datum of revelation and perfected to ever greater and more intense degrees of charity or union, um, you can you can see that there is this possibility to apply this Dionysian model to Mary and understand, oh, well, purification doesn't necessarily mean purification of sin. Why? Well, because we have already an example in Dionysius's application of purification to angels, of course, who don't have sin. And so this is this is another way in which uh, the notion of purification can be analogical or even equivocal. You know, typically the lexical meaning would be purification from some, well, obviously impurity. But in this sense, because you have to deal with the datum of revelation where Christ and Mary are both purified, well then how do we use that language? Well, we have recourse to the, uh, Gregory Nazianzus on the one hand, Dionysius on the other hand, and then how somebody like St. John of Damascus and later 
figures like Palamas, Mark of Ephesus, and the uh, intermediate or intermediary Palamites use this language of purification. Yeah, be, and maybe I want to maybe touch on that because to me, okay, you laid out a very good case that purification doesn't necessarily mean purified from sin, even um, in one sense, the angels are purified and the angels are sinless. Okay, I got that, but here's the concern. That doesn't necessarily mean that those in the East, even though that is a possibility, doesn't necessarily mean that they believed that she was pure from the moment of her conception. Right. So if you could maybe point us in the right direction of how um, it's implied that they did believe that. Now, you, you briefly touched on it when you mentioned the connection between Jesus's purification and Mary's purification. Maybe if you can elaborate a little bit further for those who in the East, especially the Orthodox, who would say, well, OK, yes, purification doesn't necessarily mean purification of sin, but we don't believe that she was pure from the moment of her conception. Right. I think, you know, I think in some sense <clears throat> that that's a legitimate question. But again, there are really two different loci of consideration. One is, you know, is this an explicit question about when she was sanctified or is this already based upon or flowing out of or is the question arising out of a prior assumption of her absolute perfection okay. in, in a sense, the most perfect way? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's pretty clear by the time you get to somebody like Mark of Ephesus, this is an assumption that Mary is superlatively perfect because she is directly associated with Christ in this order of the absolute primacy of Christ. So by, by dint of her place in, say, uh, what you might call the divine counsels for creation and her association to be the God-bearer, the perfect Theo Theotokos, there is an order of fittingness. And there's already a common assumption that she's beyond the beyond the more glory, you know, beyond the, the, the cherubim and seraphim in terms of her holiness and purity. And of course, the cherubim and seraphim and none of the angels the unfallen angels have any sin. They're all innocent, relatively relatively speaking. Well, um, all the more so will our, our lady as the very source, the Theotokos, as the very source of the divinity, manifest a purity and sanctification greater than even the angels, precisely because of her association with um, Christ, the, the, the God-man. And so the issue of the conception is, is, is that's, that's just addressing one point, when. But there seems to be a common... Um, acceptance of the fact of her absolute purity and holiness by the time especially you get to mark and then it's okay well how do we explain how she fits into the divine plan well clearly figures like palamas and uh, mark of ephesus say well she's with christ absolutely predestined as the first term of god's creation she is the purpose for 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 christ so <clears throat> in the order of execution she is the first term in order to be the mother of god but because she's primarily associated as in a sense, uh, the new Adam, new Eve kind of parallelism to the first Adam, first Eve, there's a going to be a perfect recapitulation that maps onto this and brings it to even greater perfection. So in one sense then, the question is pushed back to a more metaphysical plane of, well, how do we understand Mary in terms of the purposes of God? And then we can say, ah, well, she's the mother of God. She's got to be all holy. She's going to be fulfilling every one of these types of the Old Testament. Uh, clearly, uh, the first Eve uh, created unfallen, uh, the, the burning bush, unconsumed by divine grace, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, absolutely pure uh, in, insofar as it manifests the capabilities symbolically of creating something absolutely pure, set apart and holy and so on and so forth. There's a whole collection of texts and types that the church fathers use to argue these points. But you're getting finally to the, the, the ultimate insight is that Mary's purity is like St. Anselm says, when he's that then which nothing greater can be under God can be conceived. It's maximally perfect, maximally realized. So if you accept this and then you say, ah, in, in the eternal counsels of God with respect to creation, she's already predestined to be this in order to be the mother of God. The most fitting way in which this would be manifested is precisely as never having any part of sin, never being under the moral headship of Adam, even though physical, because she's already predestined to be mother of God. So she's created all holy in order to be mother of God. And then there are stages along the way, and getting back to the uh, question of the kind of univocal uh, interpretation of uh, purification of Jesus and Mary in the first, uh, the second chapter of Luke, I think this is what motivates this. Well, how do we deal with this univocal understanding of purification when we already know that Christ is completely exempt from sin. And it's the same kind of purification being predicated 
of Mary. Well, she must be parallel. There must be a parallelism uh, between Christ and Mary. So then we've got to deal with the notion of purification. And that's where the different resources are brought to bear. One being the Dionysian line, the other being the Maximian line, and the other being the uh, Nazianzen line, and then kind of being distilled and crystal crystallized in somebody like John of Damascus, but then further clarified, especially with respect to the um, order of intention, the absolute primacy of Jesus and Mary as co-ratios of creation in figures like Paul Amos, but more clearly in uh, Mark of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the question then of when she is rendered sa sanctified, well, there's already a presupposition by the time you get to Mark of Ephesus that she's all holy. Mm -hmm. So naturally, she would be all holy from whenever she began existence. Okay. But the reason why it wasn't treated explicitly, at least in some real sense, mm -hmm. in the East about mm -hmm. the when is because they only had when when St. Gregory Nazianzus was writing, they only had one Feast of Mary at that time. But by the time you get to the, the, the seventh century, suddenly we have four. And then we add the Feast of the Conception of St. Anne. And so then it becomes problematized theologically. And in the, in the East, it, there, there, there'll be a, a bit of a, some, some, some cognitive theological dis dissonance because you have to explain, oh, Mary died. Well, how does that work? Yeah. That and in the West, crazy. you say, oh, you know, how can she, how can she be without sin? Mm. Because then she wouldn't need to be redeemed by Christ. And so you have to explain like how both of those questions can be answered from within the liturgical, canonical, and theological tradition of the Byzantine East or the Latin West. And I think they do converge uh, and come very close together in figures uh, like uh, Bonaventure through Scotus, Palamas through Ephesus. I think you get actually pretty close to a common kind of metaphysical account because both um, really in a sense begin their analysis of the, the 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 solving of the problem in terms of the absolute predestination of christ and then how does mary fit into that plan so so how would you address those who bring up her door, her door mission and say that that's a yeah. um argument against the immaculate conception and those yeah. who would bring patristic evidence that says that the blessed virgin um had doubts in her heart somewhat implying venial sin could you maybe yeah. address those for us well yeah it's hard for it's hard for me to know because i i've not read every patris patristic text i've looked at this from a more systematic uh point of view especially focusing on figures like saint john of damascus and then later on figures like mark of ephesus saint gregory Palamas. i've read those many of those texts but i haven't looked at every single point of every father looking for exceptions or absolute um, uh, statistical consensus on the question. Um, in some sense, then, the first question one could raise is, well, what, 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 what exactly is a doubt? Is a doubt a willful um, moving away from what you know already of the, of the will of God? Well, that would clearly be sinful. But there could, there, 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 there could be attributed a doubt to Mary, even at the Annunciation, when she says, well, how can this be? I know not man. Well, that seems to be, in some sense, a doubt. Or it could just simply be... Um, interpreted more benevolently as um, a lack of clarity with respect to the next step and she's seeking further information clarification ratification confirmation on the part of the divine messenger uh, in terms of individual fathers attributing venial sin to to Mary I I can't address that specifically <clears throat> because I haven't read every text but it does seem to me to be the case that by the time you get to say um, the composition of the Akathist hymn or the writings of Saint John of Damascus or especially Saint Mark of Ephesus, and St. Saint, Saint, and, and Saint Gregory Palamas, you, you have uh, an exception or a, a, a conception, excuse me, of the tradition as not taking that into account, not, not seeing that as authoritative or determinate, determinative of the question. There seems to be a common consensus that, well, Mary was filled with every virtue, the perfection of hope, faith, and charity, and um, whatever imperfection she had, that, that can be attributed to the economy and to the limitations of being a finite creature and a finite person. Um, so in that sense, I think by the time you arrive at Ephesus, Mark of Ephesus, if he is a representative of the Byzantine tradition, that, that that's no longer determinative. Uh, with respect to the question of death, I, I think in some sense this is, I think it's a bit of a red herring because death and Sin, death, and guilt are not mutually exclusive terms. Um, just as with the fall or the, 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 the liability to sin as a result of Adam's uh, lack of fidelity to the will of God, there was, there was uh, an obligation 
or a debt to preserve the justice that God created him with. And if, according to somebody like Scotus, if he uh, persevered through this testing period, well, he'd be fitted with sanctifying grace and he would pass on this original justice, this this perfect creation in um, its integrity to, its, to his offspring. Well, this original justice, this state of righteousness, the state of being in perfect covenant with God was something that was a gift. And it was something that God commanded that he preserve. It was a decree, but it wasn't an exigency of nature itself. This was something that God gave to Adam and Eve as, as a gift. And he said, you preserve this. And so in some sense, then the obligation was to preserve this justice in that failure. Well, simply God decreed that the consequences of being created a rational mortal animal in the kind of typical uh, Damascenian definition of the term, it's also Aristotelian, um, you're going to now fall into the natural consequences of being a composite being. Composite beings tend to uh, decomposition or decompose, to separate. And in this sense, God decreed because of your lack of preserving justice, keeping my will, um, you will now undergo the penalty of physical, personal dissolution. And <clears throat> this, this was, I think, really predicated not on um, like exigencies of nature. You know, our natures were created inherently capable of falling apart again, of dying. I mean, Aristotle, St. John of Damascus, they all agree with this. Any composite finite nature is inherently ordered at some point to decom decomposition again. Uh, you can see it in the Damascene, he says in uh, the uh, philosophical chapters of the De Dialectica, he says in chapters 17 and chapters 30, chapter se 30, 17 and 37, that um, we're created rational, mortal animals. He doesn't say we're created rational. He adds the word mortal. We're, we're by nature able to die. So the issue of death does not, in a sense, um, implicate anybody in any, any actual status of sin. The fact that Mary died is simply the result of a decree that became universal upon Adam's sin, that you will now undergo the possibility that's inherent to nature. And so death is a penalty of sin, clearly, but it's kind of an extrinsic liability to death based upon Adam's sin. And then God decreed, well, yes, every man following Adam, including Adam, will undergo death. But this doesn't imply sin. This, this actually is a function of the decree of God. Um, and so in that sense, I think, you know, it, 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 it have, being, being able to die is something inherent to being human. That's in St. John of Damascus. Actually dying, that's something having to do with the decree of God. And so there's nothing that excludes perfect sanctity uh, in dying, and there's nothing that includes perfect sanctity in um, remaining perpetually alive. So could, could somebody who had, um, I guess who was in a state of original justice still die i guess that's where i'm confused well yeah this is this is again because the state of original justice is really kind of a, a remoding or a, 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 a different modalization of that nature causing that nature to preserve its integrity based upon the good pleasure of god assuming that that person continues to obey the will of god so it was possible that they die then it was also possible that they not die mm -hmm. and had they pursued pre preserved original justice well then they would not have died that natural outworking never would have taken place because it would have been prevented. So death was but natural. There's nothing in contrary sense? to nature, qua nature, that the, uh, a created person dies. And so the fact that somebody dies does not imply that they have sinned. That's that's my point. So so the is fact there a that somebody sense dies which... dependent upon? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is the, is there a sense in which death is natural then? Yes, insofar, and this is somebody, this is this is affirmed by Saint, you know, Saint Greg, Saint John of Damascus. Insofar as anything that is composite, composed of multiple principles yeah. that come together, there's a natural tendency at some point for those principles to fall apart. Right. So just as soul and body are two essential constitutive elements of the one human nature, well, so those two elements can then separate again. And this is something that is that that is readily attested to by St. John of Damascus. So when Scripture, so says, um, so when scripture uh, says death entered into the world through sin, it does. it's not necessarily meaning um, because of the sin, but just because that original justice has now been lost, now death has been allowed to 
um, do what it was naturally supposed to do. I guess maybe help me understand Romans 5. Right. I think, I think again, because there was this gift of original justice and kind of a promise of a further protection of the person in terms of maintaining the integral personal existence without dying prior to sin, there was this mm -hmm. obligation to preserve justice. Mm -hmm. And if there was a justice preserved, then they would not die. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Mm -hmm. And But in the event of sin, well, A, you're going to suffer now the penalty of sin positively, which is death as a punishment, but also a nature that dies has to be susceptible of death, right? So there's something inherent to cre uh, created nature, a created human person that renders it possible for that nature to undergo decomposition. That's all I'm establishing. Okay. So is the possibility has to realize even if the mode of its realization is a punishment, okay? okay. Or the, the, the effect of sin in terms of punishment. But again, even apart from sin, it's possible that God decreed that Adam not die, too, mm -hmm. right? Or it's possible in solidarity in some way with an extrinsic liability that every man and woman who comes into the world undergoes death at this point by divine decree. Even though there's, there's a kind of natural um, disposition or tendency to dissolution, there's a supernatural way in which uh, uh, an entity that is created can perdure without dying. And then there's also a way in which uh, an unfallen, meaning unfallen in terms of the will, not in terms of necessarily the effects, because clearly our, our Lord underwent the effects of sin, but he was without sin. So I'm, I'm, I'm distinguishing then between, well, perfect charity and um, the effects externally and a kind of defect that comes from within by deformed will. So even Christ can undergo death as a possibility voluntarily, even though he was with, he had no sin and was in perfect charity. That's because a, a by a divine decree that he would undergo death as a punishment, as a, as a, excuse me, as an act of atonement and restitution in some sense for sin. But also it's inherently possible that Christ having a created composite nature could undergo this. There is the there's the inherent possibility of dissolution of a created nature. So that's that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. So just so, because yeah. somebody undergoes death, it doesn't imply that they have sin, okay. but they are undergoing an effect of sin that's ancestral or primordial because God willed that should they sin, they will then undergo death as a punishment, but a death as a punishment already possible by dint of the the very fact composite natures this is something inherent to being a composite nature is that it can undergo dissolution and, and in fact it would take something supernatural to prevent it from undergoing dissolution so god could have created adam and eve in a state that they would have died even if they had preserved their um even if they had not sinned let me put it that way god could have yes god could have done that yeah god okay. could have done that okay absolutely yeah so instead of having a transition um, through death, there would have been a, a transition to a higher mode of life. Okay. Um, you know, the perfection of, of, of grace into glory. It still would have been a kind of transitus, a passing over, because it would have been clearly a different intensification or even perhaps motive, modification of the way in which they experienced the grace of Christ, even though obviously it's ontologically the same thing. Grace okay. is the same. Um, whether or not you're in via or in patria here, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. But perfect. But clearly being in the beatific vision or being in blessedness is a, is a perfection and an intensification of that grace. Hey, William, I know you have some questions um, and then we'll, we'll come to Eric, but go ahead and ask yours now, because I know you have to uh, jet in just a little bit. Dr. Goff. Um, thank you uh, for that, uh, Michael and Dr. Goff. I wanted to, tell you i've really enjoyed uh reading your book uh that you helped edit the spirit in the church um oh yeah thank you very very good book i've read it um uh a little bit more than than a couple of times it's really really good i i uh, i really wish i would have been able to uh have uh, to have had the chance to meet uh father feldner before he um he passed away uh, i've heard that he was a very yeah. very very uh very good soul from father christian he's told me yeah I was, I mean, really, really the amount of work that he did and um, 
the amount of influence he had on, on Father Christian was really, I can tell it was incredible because everything I've read and um, every time I talk to Father Coppice, it's, it's just, it just blows me away, really. It really does. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you were talking about Gregory Nasianzus, and the one thing that I found really incredible, I remember when, when looking at, um, I believe that's Oration 38, which by the way, um, Oration 38, I believe, is the very first time he uses the Greek prokathorothesa. But I know Father Kopp has makes a very good argument that Carmina 9 gives us a glimpse of Gregory believing in her immaculate existence. So I just want to make that clear um, um, that there are two different texts. One of them does use prokathorothesa, but the other one, he, um, Father Coppice does show that it is equally important. Um, and I believe he I believe he quotes part of Oration 38 or quotes it exactly and then adds a, a few more things. But the thing that really blew me away, and I, I know you're going to know what I'm talking about, is when we go on over to the West and we look at somebody like Rufinus, when he grabs a hold of the Greek Prokathorothesa, he translates it as immaculate, which, yeah, is, yeah, right. which, which I found incredible. That, that is precisely why Father Coppice says that it is a Byzantine version of the Immaculate Conception. Um, it's just amazing that he translates. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll make a few comments and then I'll, I'll ask you if you're aware of it having been translated or, or, ha or whether or not the word existed in the West as immaculate before Rufinus. But a few other comments I had to make, but I would like to make is, um, first off, um, Francis Mayrone, so I'm correct, he was, um, uh, he was very heavily influenced by Duns Scotus, am I correct? Yeah, he was one of the first and greatest students of Duns Scotus. He was taught directly by Scotus. So, you know, Francis uh, died in the 1320s, and Scotus died in 1308, and their time overlapped. Yeah, so he was a direct student. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. and you were talking about uh, Nicholas Cabasilas earlier, and um, I want to get a chance. I want to read the little piece from him because, um, excuse me, um, I think it's so very important. And when Nicholas Cabasilas talks about Prokathartisa, he what to me he makes a really incredible point that he says of the holy doctors who say the virgin is pre-purified Prokathartisa by the spirit, then it is yet necessary to think that purification, i.e., an addition of graces, is intended by these authors, and these doctors say that this is the way the angels are purified, with respect to whom there is nothing knavish. I, I have a question for you, because you brought it up a little while ago. Um, if we look at Luke 2, as you know, the Greek is in the plural. I think if we were to take Luke 2, and if we were to take take the purification occurring there, if we take that for sin, and if we believe that it carries with it a negative connotation, wouldn't that open the door up to more problems? Because since we're clearly told that Mary isn't the only one that undergoes purification. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, well, I think so. I think it would raise certain problems, and this is why uh, figures like uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus and later St. John of Damascus had to deal with it. And later on, Mark of Ephesus, they have to deal with this notion of purity. And so by by what do you understand, or what by what do you mean by the term purification? And because there is this uh, univocal application of the term to Christ and Mary in common, and we already know that Christ is exempt from all sin, and the application then seemingly is distributed also to Mary as exempt from sin in a manner like Christ is. Christ, by dint of the fact that he's a divine person, and with the dignity of divine person, therefore do um, absolute sanctity, and Mary, by dint of grace and her association with Christ, as the Theotokos, as the fitting vessel, the Ark of the New Covenant, in one sense, but also, um, in, in this kind of double typological relationship, she also is, in a sense, representative of the virgin earth. So, in this sense, you have you have a twofold relationship of Mary to Christ. One, she typifies the unfallen virgin earth, that from which the God-man, or the Adam, the new Adam, is generated. But also, then, she is the new Eve as the first perfect um, supernatural or spiritual spouse of Christ as Bride of Christ, uh, in this sense. So, in both senses, she she uh, represents the 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 unfallenness of the the virgin earth, but also the perfection of Christ in His work in redemption. 
with respect to the church being without stain, that heavenly Jerusalem. Well, she is uh, the first instance, the perfect instance of it, and she's also, in a sense, the promissory note that we all will achieve, even though it's through redemption and purification from sin, we all will achieve a quasi-immaculate status in terms of radical purification at some point in time. She is actually, though, she starts out from the outset because of her unique role in being both the mother of Christ and the mother of the body of Christ. Great, great points there. And so uh, I think, yeah, about, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, really, really good points. And um, one of the things that I'm reminded, in the, uh, reminded of, and I believe it, it is included in, in the, the book that you edited, I believe, I could be wrong there, but looking at what, what, what Mayrones and what, um, uh, what Blessed Dunn Scoda said, and uh, very interesting that they do, um, when they do encounter Romans 5, which uh, they recognize, they said Romans 5 perhaps is the most difficult text to tackle when we talk about this issue. I think it was very important that Michael brought up the issue of original sin. But I found it really mm -hmm. interesting. The way they, the way they reply, respond to that, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because you, you called it a red herring to say that, well, Mary died. She must have had original sin. I agree with you. I don't think it's a good argument. And as, as Dun Scotus uh, point, as I don't remember if it was Dun Scotus or, or Francis Mayrose, they point out how you look into Genesis 5 and you, you were literally told, were literally read a list of individuals that are in the line of Adam. But we know that Enoch didn't die. And yet we mm -hmm. read that he is in the line of Adam. So if we mm -hmm. find that exception, as Father Coppice point, points out, isn't that an example of God's gr gratia, God's grace? Uh, isn't that an example that uh, that this this I guess uh, divine uh, command, this divine uh, punishment, didn't befall every single individual? So if we're able to find one exception, as we are in Genesis five, we're literally told that this is a lineage of Adam. If we're able to find one exception, then wouldn't the whole argument just collapse there in and of itself? Well, I think I, <clears throat> I think it could. Uh, one thing that I think is important to bring up at this point, though, is that for Scotus, in common with uh, a lot of the Franciscan uh, tradition and the 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 um, patristic tradition, they understand both Enoch and Elijah as yes, they're being assumed, um, but they're being assumed to come back for a mission at some future time or some different time where they will undergo death. And Scotus is explicit that Enoch and Elijah will undergo death because the decree from Adam is now universal that every man undergo death, but not by dint of the same kind of necessity, not because they sinned or because they were born uh, with a debt to justice that they couldn't pay, that, that original justice, um, <clears throat> in the case of, of Mary, but because in some sense there's, um, it's more beneficial because Mary by undergoing her death, according to Scotus, can merit even through death for the sake of the body of Christ and is in greater conformity to Christ. One thing that I think Scotus does very importantly is make a distinction. He actually says physical death is not the worst effect of sin. And he says this. And what's interesting is, is, is it reminds me of a passage in Newman where he says, you know, uh, you know, all of the, the, uh, the physical maladies and disasters in the, the, the history of the world is not as great as one venial sin, okay? That's a very extreme and powerful statement about the effect of sin in the life of the soul vis-a-vis -vis God and vis-a-vis -vis the purpose and order of creation. Well, Scotus, he says, you know, Mary was actually not preserved from the worst effect, namely physical death. She was preserved from the effect of not being able to fulfill this debt to justice. Why? Because she was conceived filled with grace. The Immaculate Conception states one thing in a negative sense. It says she didn't have this liability to um, punishment because she had already had paid for her this debt to justice. Why? Not because she was given original justice and um, a kind of Edenic mode of existence. No, she understood pain and suffering, but because she was filled with a higher grace, the sanctifying grace that comes through Christ in the full, fullest sense from the very instant of her conception. So she was already in a sense created with a will in conformity with the divine will, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why she's called metaphorically spouse of the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> she was already, in a sense, created in covenant with God. Why? Well, St. Bonaventure and St. Gregory Palamas. Well, because she's the source of the covenant. She's the source of the new covenant. So if she's the source of the new covenant, she's going to already be in a position to um, give what that covenant promises. 
And so the Immaculate Conception is rendered negatively, like answering one question. Mary has no part of sin, meaning Satan never had any dominion over her, and she's not properly to be considered under the moral headship of Adam. She's more properly to be considered in terms of her predestination to be the mother of God. And <clears throat> so I think, you know, those those couple of distinctions, Skoda says, well, she actually wasn't preserved from death because it was more fitting and more useful that she died. But she was like our Lord, preserved from corruption. Um, and, you know, something from earlier discussions I, I should raise is that in the uh, the um, papal definition of the Assumption uh, uh, by Pius XII, 1950, there, they left out whether or not there was a clear assertion that Mary actually died. And, you know, I've heard the reason why is because a personal friend, I think Father Martin Jujie, the great uh, Byzantinist, the, uh, the Assumptionist, his personal opinion was is that Mary did not die precisely because he understood there was this correlation that you don't find in Scotus between death and sin. Scotus just simply rest the two apart, and you find a precedent for the rationale of saying there's no strict correlation in somebody like John of Damascus. You have to base it on a further understanding of what the divine decrees are with respect to sin and death. Death itself is not a strict corollary of uh, sin. Um, <clears throat> and so Pius XII, in a sense, this I heard actually from Father Peter, Pius XII avoided inserting into that definition that Mary died in order to not render his good friend a heretic. <laughs> so there you go, a little bit of inside baseball. But the common uh, consensus of the Franciscan tradition is clearly, and the Byzantine tradition, is that Mary died. She underwent death. So the Dormition is a euphemism in the East for her death, and that she was immediately raised or raised significantly or soon enough so that her body not undergo uh, corruption. Why? Because corruption is a sign of the effects or the reign of death and the effects of sin. And neither Christ nor Mary underwent this corruption, even though they both underwent death. Yeah, and another little bit of uh, uh, inside information that I didn't know, uh, Father Cobbins told me about it, and I, I was uh, laughing about it. I read a little bit after he told me. Um, uh, apparently, the bull in Ephibilis Deus. Uh, Is uh, that the Immaculate according... Conception? Correct, yes. Uh, okay. apparently, yeah. apparently um father coppers believes that the reason we don't have a whole bevy of of church father quotes in there was probably because pope pius really didn't like um Migne. and uh, apparently uh Migne was a real uh, real scoundrel a real thief and that is something i didn't know about i mean the yeah. massive majority of his work he robbed he sold published yeah, that's as, right. as his own so so you really have I a think bevy there... of quotes yeah well, I think there's a I think there's a book even with the title of you know the master yeah. plagiarizer or something to that effect, yeah. and it's all great about book. Pina. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great book. So really, it's incredible that Pope, uh, Pope Pius, you know that he's uh, um, hearkening to uh, Duns Scotus. You know he's hearkening even to Gregory and Asians is probably in there, but you don't have the direct quotes, quite possibly because he really didn't like Minier. And, you know, they were, I mean, what was Mine doing? You know, he was stealing a bunch of things and publishing them as, as his own and um, taking credit for it, which uh, I never knew that before I read that book, before talking to, to Father Coppice. I, I, I find that really, really um, you know, interesting to say the least. Yeah, well, you know, a, a couple of interesting uh, points to tack on to what you just said is that Pius the Ninth, uh, more so than say Leo the Thirteenth, was much closer to the Franciscans. And in, under the reign of Pius IX, it was the conventional Franciscans advocating for a figure like Antonio Rosmini. Um, and Pius IX never, never criticized Rosmini because the Franciscan ad advocacy of Rosmini in line with Bonaventure's um, epistemology, uh, analogous to his notion of divine illumination. And so uh, Pius IX had affinities with the Franciscan school, even if he wasn't a Scotist. Uh, more so than, say, Leo XIII would. And so that might have also been influential in the formulation of not just the Declaration of the Immaculate Conception, but also the theological presentation that went along with it. That famous phrase, you know, in one and the same decree. That is, that's pure scotus, but it's not actually part of the definition, but it sure makes a lot of sense. Right. Oh, no doubt. You know, it does make a whole yeah, lot of sense. Yeah. I have one more question, then I'll hop yeah. on over to, to Eric. I don't want to uh, dominate too much of the time. Are you aware of anyone before uh, Rufinus that did use that word immaculate? 
I, I, I'm trying to think. I'm sure. You, you know, know I am not sure. Oh, no. I don't know. I, I would. I would hate to say no. I would hate to say there wasn't. Um, but clearly, it's interesting that he 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 just takes one the term procatharthesia as synonymous with immaculata in the Latin. Uh, that's yes. suggestive. But again, uh, there was you know you, you don't find uh, as far as I understand you don't find really direct commentary on the part of the uh, Catholic magisterium regarding the immaculate conception until you get to somebody like Sixtus the Fourth, and you're already in the 15th century. Right. And so there's you know the development theologically actually in both the East and the West came out of the re reality and the inclusion of the celebration of the conception of St. Anne, the conception of Mary. So, okay, let's problematize this. What do we mean by all holiness? When is this? How does it define her? But I think, <clears throat> I think what the real insight here is, is A, you have a trigger from the liturgical developments, right? But there already was a presupposition of the all holiness. And so you had to develop how you understood this. Well, St. Gregory Nazianzen, he did not have the same exact viewpoint with respect to the predestination of Christ and Mary for their own sakes, apart from sin, that somebody like St. Gregory Palamas and later more clearly St. Mark of Ephesus will have. And in the West, ulteriorly, you see the development most clearly in someone like Scotus, is then when you start discussing the metaphysics of the absolute immaculate existence of Mary in terms of the order of intention, and then the coessential unity of the mother and the son, then you can start justifying, oh, this is what we mean by the immaculate existence. And then by dint of this, well, we apply it to Mary in toto. So we then have to justify, well, why is yeah. she without sin? Well, she was preserved. Why was she preserved? Well, you know, so on and so forth. I, <laughs> and in the East and the West, it's a different coloration. Yeah, I have one last question um, be, before I have to, to run. I've heard it frequently uh, brought up, people saying, well, how come nobody has ever, you know, translated the word the way Father Coppice has done? How come nobody has ever come to this conclusion? As far as I'm aware, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I'm not aware of anybody other than, than perhaps Manuel Candal and Father Coppice that have done uh, um, such a voluminous work on, on study on this particular word. Uh, uh, as far as those two gentlemen go, I'm not aware of anyone before Manuel Candal, uh, would it be correct well, to I say? Think, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's precisely because of kind of the historical accident yes. of the Damascene being translated into Latin and dealing with the notion of purgation. Yes. Well, it's easy in the Latin West to say, ah, she must be purified of at least original sin. Why? Because if she's not, then she is not redeemed by Christ. So that objection had to be solved. So there was a kind of correlation between the absolute primacy of Christ and the Immaculate Conception. Because if you affirm the absolute primacy of Christ and you affirm that he's the most perfect redeemer and, and his incarnation is unconditioned by sin, well, then it is at least possible that there is one person who's most perfectly redeemed, most perfectly saved. And that would be most fittingly his mother. OK, in the, in the, so the, 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 the notion of the absolute predestination of Christ unconditioned kind of fell out of use in the ages of the high scholastics like St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas will say it's a probable opinion, but I don't think it fits with scriptures. Bonaventure will say it's the more rational opinion, but the incarnation for the sake of redemption from sin induces greater piety. And that was his kind of pious reason. So he opted for the fact of the conditioned incarnation. But the reason it fell out of, 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 of favor with the high scholastics until you get to a figure again like Scotus is because they could not deal with the implication that if Christ was absolutely predestined, well, then Mary could be immaculately conceived. And if she's immaculately conceived, well, then she doesn't need to be redeemed. And so this was, this was the knot that needed to be cut by Scotus. Well, historically, you have a precedent in just the kind of lexical uh, translation of the Damascene's Greek you know, catharthesa, procatharthesa into Latin, it's pre purgata or purgata, right? Well, obviously, if you're being purified, well, what are you being purified from? And you already presuppose that Mary must have had sin in order to be have been redeemed by Christ. Well, then th the question is rendered moot, right? So you're not going to actually seek to explain what the Damascene means. Because there's an assumption, ah, the Damascene is obviously immaculate. And when you get to Scotus, interestingly, Scotus doesn't actually address the, Damas uh, the Damascene's use of Pergata. 
He just kind of brackets it and says, well, actually, I can give you a rationale theologically based upon common assumptions that does end up affirming the Immaculate Conception, but he doesn't solve the linguistic, historical, theological problem that the Damascene poses. That's in the Latin West. And so there's no reason to study it, okay? You're arguing the Immaculate Conceptions on grounds other than the Damascene. He's just, yeah, we can't go with him on this. He's an outlier. He is an, he is an eccentric in one sense. And you hate to say the Damascene's an eccentric, right? Um, and then ulteriorly, in the East, you moved away from an understanding of a Dionysian Polemite notion of Prokathartisa, which is rendered in terms of, no, there's this movement in history of more graces preparing for certain outcomes, you know, ultimately in the, highest, in the highest intensity, the virginal incarnation, the virginal conception of the God-man himself. Um, you move away from this reception to a kind of quasi-Thomistic reception of purification that then becomes dominant in the Greek East. So they have no motivation now to go back and explain what Prokathartisa means according to the minds of Saint Gregory Nazianzus, Saint Sophronius, up into Mark of Ephesus. And so you could read Prokathartisa as maculist, and then you say, well, it's obvious right. we have to read it as an immaculist uh, sense because she died. And because there's this creeping association and correlation of sin and death, Plus, we now see that she's purified. It's all it's in all the fathers. Well, then it must mean that the Immaculate Conception thesis is wrong and purification just simply means what it obviously means. She's obviously purified from something. But the, 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 the importance of Kappa is to say, wait a second, let's do some historical analysis, yeah. assuming the truth of the Immaculate Conception and assuming that, say, Mark of Ephesus is representative of the Eastern tradition and see, you know, where it leads us. Does it lead us somewhere else? And I think that's kind of what he's done. He's, he says, well, wait a second, you know, there was an equivocal or better analogical usage of purification and it's rooted right in the text of Luke. And so the church fathers had to deal with it. If you have to deal with it for Jesus, you have to deal with it for Mary. And this is where further speculation about um, A, incorporating Dionysian notions of angelic purification. And then- That was, that was, that was pseudo Dionysian, right? That's right, yeah. Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite, guy, yeah. Gotcha. Yep, that's right. <clears throat> and then, you know, using St. Maximus the Confessor's theology that really affirms the absolute primacy of Christ, and then moving forward to uh, Mark of Ephesus and then speculating upon the divine eternal counsels. And it's interesting, you have somebody like Scotus in the West and Mark of Ephesus in the East, both saying, well, actually, the best account that we can give to justify the immaculate existence, the, the, the perfect created existence of our Lady is to see them in terms of the divine counsels and her essential correlation with her son as that anti-typological fulfillment of all those old uh, uh, types. It's almost like they're saying the same thing. <laughs> Dr. Goff, thank you for your time. I'm gonna pass it on over to Eric. It was a pleasure, yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Hey, Dr. Goff. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple things here before I get to a question. Um, you know, you, you were talking about how the sentence of death was extrinsic to the sin, you know, to sin and the sinner, namely Adam. Uh, that that's that that seems to be assume, assumed uh, or or implied in Genesis three. Uh, verse 22 where it says then the lord said behold the man has become like one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever therefore he was banished from the garden of eden so it seems as though uh eternal life as in not in the quality but in the duration uh mm -hmm. was possible even in the state of sin um yeah it seems it seems to me yeah that's possible but it'd be entirely unfitting right, uh you yeah. know this is this is like with you know dun scotus speculates about you know the the different modes god could have used to undergo you, you know to uh enact the atonement and he could have said you know he could have forgiven us and um allowed us or brought us up into the divine 
uh, life in a the perfect sense, apart from any kind of atonement or inter interior purification and sanctification on our part. But that would be entirely unfitting. And in a sense, it would be a kind of hell. And right. so God does what is most fitting and most charitable. And in this sense, you can see death as a charitable verdict because of what this would imply if somebody went on in this condition of sinfulness, of rebellion, without any impetus or possibility to a atone, but also a warning that, oh, this is, you know, sin is the, uh, death is the fruit of sin. The wages of sin is death, as Paul, as Paul would say. Right, yeah. And I, I know that somebody in the chat was asking uh, about the canons of Carthage. Uh, the Latin the Latin version is uh, canon 109. I'm not sure what it is in the Greek version, but uh, that, that canon puts an anathema on anybody who says that God created Adam mortal as if as if he would have died by necessity, whether he sinned or not. Now, that anathema is not uh, falling on what we're saying here because we're not saying that Adam uh, was created uh, by the plan of God to die if he had continued in original justice. Uh, the, the plan was, well, when we talk a plan here, we, we're, we're going to we we can get into the weeds about Plan A, Plan B. We're not going to do that. Um, but yeah, the projection, I guess you could say, was if he was to live in perpetual obedience, he would not have died because it was God's purpose to extrinsically bring him to higher higher forms of life if he was going to uh, undergo a transition at all. So I think that. I think that canon is not is not really applying exactly to what we're saying. Uh, no, I think yeah. I, I just you quickly comment. There's two things. Um, you know, one is the notion of creation. Creation in terms of uh, creation has a teleological, purposive aspect to it because it's a result of the freedom of God, and that has to be that 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 entails a certain um, understanding of the purposes of God in the economy of salvation. So yes, God was man was not created mortal in this sense, but that's to be distinguished in terms of the economy or the purposes for creation from nature considered abstractly in an Aristotelian mode. Like, okay, what are the constituent elements of a created nature? Well, by definition, as nature, well, yeah, of course it can die. Of course it can decompose. St. John of Damascus recognizes this, but this is a different statement. This is a statement about the possibility, right? but not about the actuality. And so the actuality depends upon whether or not man really dies about God's will for whether or not he preserves that man in existence or he allows him to die either A, by just simply not holding him into being or, or B, by declaring positively that he will die as a penalty for sin. Because clearly um, the fact presupposes the possibility. The fact that Adam did die and we all die presupposes that there's something inherent about us in terms of our natures able to die god didn't change what we are he just said ah yes now you will undergo this possible effect as a punishment for, for or at least in terms of the reality of sin right yeah so the, the, uh, am i coming through clearly or am i or am i is the audio fine okay good it seems to be okay yeah so anyway to that questioner there as dr goff is saying that the telos, the teleological end of man, uh, eradicated concretely uh, the mortality of Adam. But like, if we were to understand abstractly the nature itself, uh, That's right. which was not reality then, but if we were to take the theory, the concept, and put it into the abstract thought, there's something susceptible to death and decomposition. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there's an, an, an analogy. Uh, clearly, the fact presupposes the possibility, right? Even if that fact would not have been eventuated. Now, it may be open to question whether or not Adam and Eve knew they could die before it was decreed that they would die. Maybe they just thought like a little child they'd live forever, you know, or they by, by some sort of necessity. Well, I'm me. I must just go on forever. I can't imagine myself actually dying. Um, in a similar way, um, <clears throat> the fact of the incarnation presupposes its possibility. Now there is a different order, but there's an analogy. Um, with the incarnation, the fact was unimaginable in some sense. It was uninventable. Right. But once we understand that this is what actually occurred, then we understand, oh, there are possibilities for human nature 
not just to terminate in their own independent existence, but actually for a human nature to terminate hypostatically in a higher nature, namely a divine nature. And this is like something that we never would have imagined and it exceeds any kind of natural power. Well, there's a kind of analogy to this is, is just by dint of the concrete reality. Yes, they were not created mortal, but nevertheless, because of the fact of death, it must imply that it's possible that they do die. But the reason for why they die can be different. Right, absolutely. That clears that up. Um, the other question I wanted to ask about this was, you know, we're big fans of St. John Henry Newman here. And uh, in some of our dialogues with the Eastern Orthodox, and even, even with some of the Oriental Orthodox, the, the very concept of development of doctrine seems to them like uh, an, a, a sort of an excuse to explain novelty and change. Would you say that the East, the Eastern tradition, had undergone development of doctrine when it comes to the even the sinlessness of the Virgin Mary? Would that be a would that be a product of development, or would you say? that uh like an or like for example i'll speak on behalf of of uh, uh you know an eastern orthodox interlocutor who would say uh if it's obscure in the fathers then it can't be dogma and so you know this is why some of the orthodox look at this doctrine of the immaculate conception or even the sinlessness of, of the virgin mary and they think well this could never i'm thinking of like uh father uh Oh, the name he's, uh, escapes me. Uh, a popular author, um, German guy. Oh, I can't remember his name. He wrote a bunch of books. I can't can't realize why I can't remember. But anyway, uh, he he said that the Immaculate Conception, the sinlessness of Mary, or even the Assumption of Mary, could never come to the level of dogma, where where to deny it would somehow restrict you from perfect communion with the with the church um so what would you say about that and and the development of doctrine well i i think clearly there is a development of doctrine i can't specify exactly um all the conditions of what that development or what must be included in a development um for it to be a legitimate development but of course newman gives us his first criteria i believe the preservation of type and of course, to change a type is to, or to alter a type is to destroy a type. So in some sense, there has to be this, this kind of common ratio. Um, St. Bonaventure will, you know, affirm that um, reasons within themselves have further ramifications just by dint of the fact that we reason discursively, or I'm, what I'm saying is ideas, teachings, will have further implications by the fact that we're limited and we can infer quasi- ad infinitum. You know, we can kind of infer conclusions forever and ever. Uh, so in that sense, clearly there's a development. Um, and, you know, in, 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 in this sense then, well, what is a development but the application of reason, prayer, oftentimes through the witness and experience and testimony of the saints to the common life of the church, meaning the life of reading scripture, reading the fathers, reading the doctors, and praying and living in the liturgy. And so, okay, how do we understand these things? So in the sense of the sinlessness of Mary, well, in the liturgy, we always pray that she's all holy. She's immaculate. Uh, so what does that mean? Are we going to take that literally? Are we going to take that metaphorically? Are we going to place qualifiers around this? Uh, well, it seems clear that when we get to someone like Mark of Ephesus, he recognizes this in the most literal sense. Yeah, she is literally all holy, meaning that she has no part of a lack of holiness. So then, is he is he developing the tradition? Yes, because he's drawing out implications, or he's rendering explicit things that are already present, uh, in a general sense, and clarifying them. Um, and, and, and in that sense, of course, there is development of doctrine. Right. Yeah. Because it's just the, the the drawing out of inferences, or the collating of one piece or witness of the tradition with another, and saying, ah, this sheds new light on it. This presents us with a new concept. Uh, with respect to theologians who say that, you know, such things as the assumption are, uh, you know, theologumina, I just, I, I, don't, I don't understand how one can actually believe that, uh, just simply because uh, the liturgy prays it. 
we, 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 we have a feast of the Dormition. We have a feast of the Assumption. And so how are we doing this with canonical approbation, no matter what jurisdiction you're in, if it's completely false? I think in some sense you have to then um, question the, the integrity and efficacy of the church in its sacramental and ritual life. If you're going to have a universal feast for a given church, that is just simply made up. Right. I just say, no, this is something we pray. And obviously, if we're praying sincerely, we believe it. And we're praying it on the authority of the church who's giving us this feast, recognizing this feast, and presenting it to us as true. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's important. And the point you just made is very important because uh, a lot of guys who come to the you know Orthodox tradition or the Roman Catholic tradition or the Catholic tradition, um, they will they'll look for the earliest references uh, as if you know the earlier the better, which is fine. That's fine. But if we can find a document uh, and we can have a plethora of evidence in the in, in the historiography that something became universal in the eighth century in the church, mm -hmm. that's good enough for us to know what the church believed backwards in time, even if we don't have the survived documents proving it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. But I think I think there has to be a distinction made between implicit and explicit. Um, right. Clearly, right. if, if uh, certain propositions are at the level of um, implicit and there's a certain lack of clarification, well, then there could be concretely, like in the minds of believers, various opinions about the common doctrine. But if there's a reasonable development and then a recognition, a kind of common ordinary recognition liturgically um, by uh, representative and authoritative theologians and fathers, well, then we can say, ah, there is a kind of reasonable development that was recognized and codified later on within the history of the life of the church that is meaningful. And it protects those earlier teachings and it gives them, ah, this is the objective content even if it was only implicitly or incompletely stated. Right. Um, and of, of course, you have to you have to make this distinction because there are, you know, boots on the ground, there are all sorts of good faithful who are material heretics. And this right. is just simply because they don't understand the implications or the meaning of many things that are taught. But there is this attitude or disposition of faith informed by charity that says, I accept what the church teaches. That, that means the magisterial function in whatever juridical... Um, ecclesial reality you're in. In some sense, there's a similarity between Orthodox and Catholics insofar as Orthodox believe the magisterial teaching manifested through official documents and especially witnessed to by scripture and fathers and then lived out in liturgical expression. That no, this is the ratification. So this is the correct interpretation of this earlier data, even if there are material um, differences between great theologians. So I, I, I see no problem with that. And I think what your point is, is yeah, what the later recognition, the consensus reached through a magisterial affirmation and positing of this, this clarifies what must have objectively been the case in the teaching prior to. It's not simply made up because you can't weave it a whole cloth, but it can be something that is a particular reception. And I mean, I wanted to go back to a point you made earlier, is you say that if you can't find it in the early church, it can't be made dogma. Well, how far back do we go? Do we go back to Nicaea? I mean, have you read about the history of Chalcedon? Have you, you know, looked into the the life and reign and times of Justin, Justinian, and Theodora? I mean, really? It was all perfectly clear, you know. Serge, you know, Severus was just simply uh, a hypocrite, and right. he, you know, he didn't read any of those fathers. Yeah, uh, you know? we have a, a sub deacon in the Syriac uh, Orthodox Church that will be. Uh, that I'm sure he's listening. He'll be happy that you you said that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that can be the case. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. I, I think there's difficulty. I mean. Yeah, I, I, I believe I believe work. as well. Yeah. I mean, that's just. It's just sometimes you read the fathers in the synods, and and sometimes you know one commentator or another will make it sound like we're not we're not inventing anything new, we're just handing on, and that's true. That's true. But with these necessary distinctions that are ontologically there, um, have to be made. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you have an example, obviously, the typological reception and interpretation of even the days of creation. 
You know, uh, St. Basil the Great commented on it. Uh, St. Bonaventure wrote a 500 page incomplete treatise on this. And they said, everything about the entire history of the world is contained in seed form, in just the narrative of the, t the, of the seven days of creation. And I could say, well, yeah, that's true. But you know what? I'm not going to be able to figure that out. And so in some sense, then, there's this movement from implicit to explicit. And it's clearly you're not inventing anything. Everything was front loaded by, the, by God the Father in the very act of creating in the first seven days. But yet there was an unfolding and, and an explicitation through time, through interventions, especially of a son, clearly as the point, but also through his son's appointed teachers. I think, I think a key thing that people need to understand about theology and dogmatic theology in the life of the church, the life of faith, is that it's ultimately predicated upon a divinely appointed authority. We'd have no direct access to the intrinsic truths of these posited revealed data. We apply reason in terms of their coherency and, re and, and in terms of their development. But of course, we can't discover these things or prove them in themselves. And this is the important point of the incarnation. You know, Christ didn't speak. He spoke with, you know, obviously in incredible rhetorical skill and brilliance. But the point of, about his speaking and teaching was that it was with the authority of the Father. And it's this notion of authority. It's coming from the source. And, you know, this, this, this Christianity is not a textbook religion. That's, the, that's an important thing to realize, is that you cannot reduce it to a set of instructions like in a manual. Right. It actually always is dependent upon authority, living appointed apostolic authority that derives from Christ. And because we believe Christ is from the Father and he sends his spirit, the spirit continues to preserve and guide these authorities today. That's, that's really the, the difficult problem is that it ultimately is based upon a recognition and an intervention of authority. Yeah, I, I, I think that some of that is just, you know, what must have been going on, you know, from 1841 to 1844 in the, in the mind of uh, St. John Henry Newman. This was, yeah. you know, all these years after writing those tracts and then finally, you know, coming out with his uh, treatise on the, on the Council of Trent and uh, there was a tract that was condemned. But this was something that is just there. It's it's not it's not a matter of do we believe in it or not. It's 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 it's, it's inferred. <laughs> That's how Saint John Henry Newman said that there would be a witness and an arbiter that goes alongside the revelation in order to confirm the contents. Um, so anyway, I don't know if we have time for the question on Saint Agatho's letter or not. I'm I'm, I'm satisfied with waiting yeah um we'll we'll ask that and then go ahead and go to check questions we have just a moment. okay so no I, I i we didn't have time to really go into this issue before but um it, you know it's often claimed uh that in uh saint agatho's tome or his famous letter to the council of constantinople 681 where there's you know over and over again the, a reaffirmation that our Lord has two uh, native wills, two native operations. And sometimes I have seen in the blogosphere and I've seen it in text where the, this implies uh, the distinction that, you know, gets made in the Eastern tradition between the essence and the energy or the, the essence and the operations within the nature of God. Mm -hmm. um, my reading of Agatha's letter is that what's really being driven home there is to maintain the duality of natures. Um, and by doing so, we necessarily distinguish will and operation in Christ into two, because you got to have one that pertains to the property of his nature in the human being and one that pertains to the property of his nature in the God in, as God being. So I, I have never seen this uh, fleshed out in a way that demonstrates that Agatha is working with something like Maximus or Sophronius. Um, in your reading, do you think that Agatha is really implying the essence and energy distinction? 
I, yeah, I, I, my understanding is, is yes, he is, he is at least presupposing some distinction between essence and energy, both with respect to Christ and his human nature and with respect to uh, <clears throat> God in himself. Um, there does seem to be a distinction between essence and operation or, or energy. Uh, and I think, the, I think the more important point here uh, for understanding, say, the Polymite essence energies distinction on the one hand, or perhaps the scotistic formal distinction, and here's an important, uh, you know, this is a bit of a parenthetical. Scotus's formal distinction is a real distinction for all you Polymites out there, okay? But it's not a real distinction in the scholastic sense, because real distinction in the scholastic sense implies independence and or actual separability, okay? But it's real insofar as it's in the words of Scotus, ex natura rei. It's not a distinction of reason, meaning the reason doesn't supply the distinction in order to clarify its own understanding. No, the distinction imposes itself on the mind. So the distinction is prior to the mind's operation and the mind understands this distinction, discerns this distinction because of what it's, what it's um, apprehending, okay? <clears throat> so that's an important thing. So there's a great ambiguity in this notion of real distinction that needs to be clarified. Because clearly, if one says it's a scholastic real distinction and one wants to be a polymite, well, then you're affirming that God is composed, okay? But if one wants to say it's only a virtual distinction and it's a scotistic formal distinction, meaning it's not ex natura rei, well, then you're saying um, that it's only something the mind brings to it, when in fact, neither is the case, you know. Uh, what the what the Polymites need to understand, or at least specify for our understanding, is what do they mean by real in this sense, and what are they excluding of the Latin tradition, and what um, <clears throat> the Polymites also need to understand when they're opposing the uh, essence energies distinction to the West is that formal distinction is real insofar as the mind doesn't make it up. Okay, and so that that's an important thing. It's real. It's objective. It's not merely subjective. And so if we, if, if the people in this discussion can actually clarify what is meant by real distinction between essence and energies from a polymite perspective, and then people can also affirm that the formal distinction is relevantly real insofar as it's not just made up, um, then we can both say, ah, there's overlap in this Venn diagram on this notion of real. Now we have to further specify what we mean by real, because obviously we can't mean composition. No, nobody on this side can mean composition. OK, so, you know, that's a parenthetical. I wanted to I wanted to throw that out there because I feel like there's a great deal of fog and haze about what we mean by real and what we mean by distinction here. And this needs to be clarified because there there are uh, semantic and conceptual specificities in the Latin tradition that perhaps aren't present in the Greek tradition. And what's at stake needs to be needs to be clarified not just a very generic notion of like we're really serious about this distinction between essence and energy uh, yeah but i mean is god composed is god um compounded of items that exist prior to him or that he's dependent on well i no of course not that's excluded by all orthodox uh fathers uh now getting back to your 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 question which after that segue oh um i think the important point about agatho is he is not dealing explicitly, I don't think, in mind with this um, <clears throat> multitudinous of energies in God. I don't know if he has that in his mind or not, but I think it's the principles by which he arrives at the distinction between um, nature, power, and its operation with respect to God. You know, you have divine nature, you have, you have the power of volition, and you have the opera operation of volition. How he distinguishes those, on the one hand, both in 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 Christ's divine nature and in his human nature is important because those that type of distinction and that type of analysis, I think, objectively, and here's this notion of development, is St. Mark of Ephesus, is St. Gregory Nazianzus uh, an, a, a valid witness in their reception and interpretation of the prior, prior patristic tradition, then you could say, ah, I see how Agatho, I see how Constantinople III and prior um, uh, latter in 649, how these theologians were reasoning, and we can apply the same kind of reasoning and say, ah, I can come up with further distinctions between energies in God because the energies manifest themselves. So, of course, um, with respect to, say, just the, the power of volition or the faculty of volition, it will have many distinct operations. It will have many distinct terminations. It will, it will, it will, terminate ad extra in many different modes. 
And then you can say, well, what's the basis then for their distinction? And then you can begin discussing uh, questions of energies. But again, I think it's the it's the it's not so much the conclusion of the analysis, but it's the style and method of the analysis that allows for a kind of ulterior uh, development in somebody like Gregory Palamas to then say, ah, we can see multiple energies in God distinct from the one essence because there are multiple uh, operations or terms or modes in which he manifests himself. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and, I mean, you know, the effects or the terminations at extra is very important for me um, to yeah. make that distinction because, you know, coming from, I'm coming from a more Thomistic point of view, when I first heard about Palamism and started looking into it, <laughs> what it looked like to me was uh, maybe not Palamas himself, but many, uh, you know, some of the neo palamite interpreters today, it almost seemed to me as if they, they were just trying to get God into creation, okay? And, and, and the only way to get him in here is if we break him up into two different things. You know, the one thing that's not passable, that can't ever have accident, and then mm -hmm. the energies that can come into creation and work in time and motion and space, that's problematic to me. I mean, when you just say that, you know, just that, like just like that, that I mean, because then they want to say that the energies are uncreated. And so then it, to me, it becomes a question of how do you have an uncreated accident, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it's important for, I think. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can have an uncreated accident. I think, in terms of the uncreatedness of the energies, uh, it's referring to the source and their objective. You know, ex nature rei or ex parte rei uh, distinction within God. And I think, really, the kind of polemite analysis is is you know, I guess there are two points. One is why the analysis of multiple energies, and then two, why positive energies in the first place. And I think they both have to do with the notion of, of, of infinity, you know, and the notion of infinity that comes from uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus, also St. Gregory of Nyssa, as well as especially St. John of Damascus. And this is a notion of infinity as maximal, unsurpassable, uh, incomprehensible by anything other than something infinite. And so if God in his essence is intrinsically, absolutely, formally, modally infinite, well, clearly, this can't be participated as infinite, right? right? Because that would imply a contradiction. That would imply the creature becomes infinite. Right. And so the energies themselves then come out of an, of an analysis of how God actually concretely manifests himself. And so you have the notion of, okay, if he's going to create, well, we know he creates from, or he could create from the fact that he did. And we know that there are different energies from the fact that his act of creation manifests itself in different modes and in different terms. And so, okay, we then start distinguishing between energies. But when we speak of the uncreatedness of the energy, A, we're saying, yeah, they're fully God. Um, God is in each energy, but yet God is not exhausted by the notion or the energy itself. Why? Because God is an, a sea of infinite substance. And so he will infinitely transcend any particular energy and any particular way in which he can manifest himself at extra. But there also is, if you want to say there's an origin, well, there's also a term. And so inherently, an uncreated energy is going to terminate in a created effect. And right. it's only right. by the created effect um, actually coming into existence by virtue of the uncreated energy being um, routed or manifested through the, the, the volition of God that we would even know there is such an uncreated energy. Right. And that, but, that, the, but the effect is perfectly created. That's the whole point. You know, yeah, you can't you can't say important. that they're one of the same. It's a relationship that is volitional and causal. It's not a relationship that is formal or material. Right. Yeah. That's, it's, it, uh, it, there uh, cannot yeah, be a formal right. identity. Yeah. Th yeah. So th thank you for that uh, on the created effect termination that that to me is very important. And well, you know, there's there's a helpful the, the, the helpful a helpful way of understanding this is in terms of um, Anselmian notion of simple perfections versus pure perfections, and both are able to be manifested at at extra by God. A simple perfection is just simply a created nature, like a dog. It's a simple perfection as a complete nature, but in terms of its perfection, it's limited. Why? Well, because it's material. It's it's composite, but there also are pure perfections. What 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 Anselm calls uh, perfectiones simpliciter simplices, um, which 
are perfections also that manifest themselves at extra. God manifests himself at extra through terminating in created entities. But these kinds of perfections don't of themselves, even though they're manifested and instantiated at extra in a finite mode, they don't of themselves imply finitude. And that's like spiritual things, like the notion of what a, what a person is, uh, what intellection is, what volition is, okay? And so when we understand the distinction between, say, a simple perfection and a pure perfection, we can say, ah, well, certain perfections by which God manifests himself or certain energies, well, they can't be, um, they can't be in themselves divine. They can't be contained eminently in a divine way. He, I mean, formally, they can't be formally divine. He contains them eminently or eminiter, eminentiter. Um, and it's by virtue of his creation and termination at extra that these simple perfections can manifest God's causality, but also certain um, pure perfections imply no finitude or um, infinitude in themselves, but they will always be manifested in either a finite or infinite mode. And the interesting thing about pure perfections and, sim and simple perfections is unlike the infinity of the divine essence, which cannot be comprehended or spoken, except by an infinite act of speech, namely the Father generating the Son, um, these pure perfections, nevertheless, in terms of their definition, are graspable by a finite mind and able to be manifested in creation in a finite mode. And so you see a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of representation, an imaging of what it would be, what, what, a, what an uncreated perfection is, only in a finite mode. But this allows you to then say, ah, well, because of this simple perfection in itself being limited conceptually, I can conceive of it. So it's distinct from other perfections that God must have that are also manifest in creation. But insofar as I recognize them, I recognize them in a finite mode. If I remove the finite mode and say, ah, this must be the case in God, but only in a maximally perfect or infinite mode, then we can see, ah, now, we, now we're talking about energies or formal perfections in the Godhead that are distinct but yet nevertheless can be known and manifest manifest in creation and in a certain sense participated in uh, in creation and by creatures themselves. So it's, it's you know, you're thinking about energies, you're thinking about, oh, this is something that could be um, comprehended and participated to some degree, whereas the infinite, uh, the, in, the, the infinite superlative super essence of God cannot be uh, comprehended or participated in qua infinite. So how is God going to do something outside of himself? How are we going to participate uh, either as created or as being divinized in God in a relevant sense that's realistic and true without collapsing into monism or panentheism, uh, you know, two kind of twin related errors? Yeah, the yeah, that's the distinction you're making there uh, between the, you know, uh, simple perfection and the pure perfection. That's a good one because... You have some theologians and some philosophers who want to say that everything that's ad extra is simply just created effect and they're congruous in their quality. It's just a created effect, you know? Yeah. But what you're saying here is you can have something on the side of ad extra, which is in the realm of finitude, but which not formally, but contains something of the infinite. Yes, yes. It's just simply it's 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 just simply the the non-implication that this perfection has to be instantiated and manifested in a finite mode. Where a dog, it has to be finite for it to be manifested. But will or volition or personhood, that doesn't have to be finite to be manifested. And so in this sense, then if you if you then look in terms of orders of dependency, well, if a finite will is not the cause or explanation of its own existence, there must be some higher cause. And this must be infinite will. And so therefore you move in terms of dependency or priority from the finite side of the disjunct to the infinite side of the disjunct. And you navigate the linkage between what, what are commonly, well, I mean, it's in, in scotistic parlance, uh, transcendental notions, transcendental perfections. And so that allows you to navigate while still specifying, no, there's an abyss between finite in mode and infinite in mode. Right. Even if the, At the, same or the time. idea is the same. Yeah, but at the same time, on one side of that link is the ad extra, and on the other side is the ad intra. Yeah, that's is, right. Yeah, yeah one that's... terminates. Yeah, one terminates in, in in something else. One is just simply an internal action. Yeah. Well, we could talk about this for hours, Doctor. I think you, <laughs> we'll go to the questions now. I thank you for okay. clarifying that, though. <laughs>
Yeah, let me um, go to one here that I saw around 728. Give me just one second while I pull it up because I want to be able to bring it up on the screen. It takes just a second for me to navigate my way back there. All right, here we go. Uh, should be coming up here in just a second. All right, so if uh, is, I'm sorry, if absolute divine simplicity is dogmatized, who cares what Scotus or Bonaventure taught? So maybe can you explain some of the misunderstandings behind the term absolute divine simplicity, whether it's been dogmatized, and the importance of Scotus and Bonaventure to this discussion? Well, sure. Uh, you know, absolute divine simplicity. Well, again, you have to unpack your terms by what you mean by absolute and simple. Uh, uh, the, 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 in terms of the dogmatic definition of what, uh, what it means when we say God is simple, it's just omnino simplex. That means just absolutely without composition or in every way without uh, composition. And simple is just simply the uh, negation or the contrary of being composed. Uh, and composed means here in typical Latin uh, scholastic and Greek patristic parlance, it means not subject of, not, not composed of parts that are separate, that come together to make something new, namely God. Um, God is not um, a part of something else. And God is not subject, or it's it's impossible for God by nature to become part of something else in terms of either increasing or decreasing imperfection. That's that's simply what is being stated. So absolute divine simplicity just seems, simply means that God is what he is. Uh, it doesn't specify anything further about essence energies or um, formal distinction or uh, divine ideas and how we uh, can distinguish those things. There's a certain account that is specifically Thomistic. But that Thomistic account is just a valid theological explanation within a larger family of valid theological and metaphysical explanations. And ultimately, I mean, come on, nobody sees the essence of God in itself. Um, nobody has direct insight. Nobody comprehends this. So when we're talking about simplicity, ultimately, we're saying something apophatic. It's like, wait a second, we cannot comprehend, we cannot own, we cannot possess uh, the divine being in our knowledge. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, a kind of uh, you know, God is just this kind of amorphous, really big, infinite soup that has no distinction. Thomas himself doesn't believe that. Uh, so absolute divine simplicity, sure, it's dogmatized, but you have to understand what you mean by absolute and simple. Simple meaning simply God is not made out of parts and he's not subject to be coming parts. He's not subject to an increase or a decrease in perfection. And absolute means, well, God is what he is of himself in every way. Um, yeah. You know, absolute actually yeah. isn't in the definition. That's an English uh, trans translation of omnino, which just means in every way. And I, I think that's an important um, issue that you mentioned, because a lot of people who use the term absolute divine simplicity, what, what's being assumed here is the nominal distinction of the attributes within God. Um, so they're assuming that that has been dogmatized. Right. So if the nominal distinction has been dogmatized, why is Scotus or Bonaventure relevant? Right. And as you right. note, well, no, it, that, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, discussing the attributes per se and, and what kind of distinction is being made. Right. You know, even even St. Thomas will he will say that uh, the, 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 the distinction, say, of the perfections or the divine ideas in God are distinctions of reason, but he will still say it is by the reason reasoning that we come to these distinctions. So in some sense, they are reason dependent, but he will go on to say he's he's not as robust as, say, Bonaventure or Scotus or Palamas and saying, no, these reasons are objective and they're prior. But he will mm -hmm. say there is some objective found cum fundamento in re. There is some foundation in re in the in the reality of God himself yeah. that explains why we even can make these distinctions. And so it's not an absolutely undifferentiated um, unity, nor is it merely names. No, there's something in God, there's something about God, I should say, that justifies making distinctions about God without um, compromising his um, absolute perfection and identity with himself, meaning he's not composed or not composable. Uh, and, okay, we, 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 he asked about Bonaventure. Well, I mean, I would just say from a, from a, a Catholic standpoint, Bonaventure is one of the two primary doctors of the church of the Middle Ages alongside St. Thomas. So Sixtus V said St. Thomas and Bonaventure had equal authority, even with Eterni Patris in 1879. Um, the minister general of the Franciscans wrote to Leo and says, well, does this now uh, revoke uh, 
Sixtus V and Triumphantus Jerusalem in 1588? And he said, no, of course not. Um, and so why do we care about what Bonaventure taught? Well, because Bonaventure is a primary doctor of the church and he's a credible witness of uh, the tradition up to his up to his day, like St. Thomas, like St. Mark of Ephesus, like St. Gregory Palamas. These are authoritative witnesses of the tradition. And they've been given magisterial approval, along with uh, same with Scotus to a lesser degree. Elijah asks, um, did John of Damascus believe Mary had no concupiscence from the moment of her existence? I don't know the answer to that question because I haven't read uh, all of the of, of the Damascene in Greek. I've looked very carefully at the philosophical chapters as well as um, the uh, De Fide Orthodoxa and nothing immediately comes to mind in terms of the De Fide Orthodoxa, but I would have to read all of his Marian sermons and have a more comprehensive notion mm -hmm. about uh, what the Damascene concretely believed about concupiscence and what the Damascene would have meant concretely and specifically about concupiscence. It does seem clear that um, the Damascene did believe that she was absolutely sanctified and holy uh, and that she had no personal sin, but whether or not uh, she had concupiscence insofar as a tendency to venial or actual or uh, mortal sin. Uh, I couldn't say. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the Damascene the, sure. that well. Sure. Um, Focus asks, is the uncreated light created? And... I, he doesn't necessarily give any context here, but I, I think this was just in relation to your discussion with um, Eric. Well, I would say, I would say, is the is the is the father the son? And that that would be my question. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, no, and so clearly, no to the second question. Obviously, the uncreated light is in reference to the to the origin, and it's giving it's specifying. Um, what is being experienced, but clearly there's a created term, namely a creature. So a creature insofar as the experience uh, is, is, is happening, well, this is happening in a created term, a created uh, person and a created kind of actuation or event. Uh, so you'd have to distinguish between origin and termination, just like you'd have to distinguish between say God and creation in um, the act of creation itself. Is the, is, the, is the creator created? Well, clearly not, no. Uh, but yet he terminates at extra. Anything he does at extra would have to be by dint uh, created. And also the father eternally, well, he generates the son. He communicates the, the, the one substance of the divinity to the son. Well, is he the son because his action terminates in the son? No, he remains father. So again, you'd have to distinguish between uh, origination and termination. termination. Insofar as the uncreated light terminates in the experience of a created person, well, the, the person experiencing it and the experience itself is created in some sense. But nevertheless, what's being experienced is uncreated. This one is an interesting one I hear a lot. 101 Caliber says, Dr. Goff, have you heard a criticism that Latin Catholic theology leads to atheism? What are your thoughts on it? Christus Yanaros makes the claim, for example. Well, I, 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 don't see, I don't see any immediate connections. I mean, I've heard people say, for example, uh, you know, I mean, obvious one would be, well, scandal in the church would clearly be a kind of moral uh, occasion for rejecting Christianity and uh, then ending up being an atheist because the uh, faith in the church and its divine institution and uh, perdurance and governance and preservation is undermined. Well, one could then revert to atheism, but I don't think that's necessarily a logical kind of case, but it, it could be reasonable and justifiable uh, in a very subjective sense. You know, you can understand why somebody would do this. Uh, if you're going to make a strict logical case, I've heard people make the, I think, exaggerated claim that uh, Catholic teaching on God and the Trinity is somehow pagan. Uh, and obviously people bring in discussions of absolute divine simplicity and filioque uh, and say that this is pagan. And obviously if it's pagan, it ends up into monism. And if it's monism, uh, it's essentially deism because clearly you have no creator at that sense, at that point. And if it's mere deism, well then why doesn't it you know, end up just being atheistic? But I think if you're going to take that kind of reasoning, uh, I think in some sense, it's just, it's just a rhetorical flourish, yeah. Uh, Catholic, Latin Catholicism leads to atheism, but I would just say, well, what do you mean by Latin Catholicism? Because, you know, I'd probably be an atheist too if I believed what you believed about Latin Catholicism, but 
I think there's probably more to be said. I think somebody said on the show a, a long time ago, you know, if you've got an institution uh, so developed with so many great minds, so many different approaches to common questions, uh, it's hard to say that Latin Catholicism in a monolithic, unqualified sense leads to anything, um, unless you're already living in the life and existing as a Latin Catholic, but then you'd probably have a tendency to just stay Latin Catholic. Uh, that would probably just lead to being Latin Catholic if you were Latin Catholic, not atheist. Uh, so if you want to make a philosophical or dogmatic kind of argument, well, we can go down that route. But I think, my goodness, you're taking a large onus because you're going to have to not only argue with, um, you know, a billion, a billion people living today who happen to be Latin Catholic and aren't atheists, so far as I can tell, or maybe they are implicitor. I mean, but then, you know somebody has special insight there. So I don't, I honestly don't know what that, what that means. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, I hear you. It seems more polemical than it actually is uh, convincing. All right. Uh, CMS asks is, well, let me see. Why can't I pull it up? There it is. Is pure act a description of God that is compatible with SCOTUS? Sure. Yeah. Because pure act just simply means, um, God has no uh, potency. God is in himself uh, always who he is. I mean, Scotus will describe this in common with the Latin tradition as aseity and inseity. Uh, his uncompoundedness means that he is perfectly what he is. He perfectly actualizes his nature eternally in and through himself. Uh, so if you mean by actus curus, uh, just simply God is who he is and is not subject to change or increase or diminution in perfection. Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, and Bonaventure uses um, Octus Puros in many texts, and I'm sure Scotus does too. I just can't think of any. Uh, but if you mean by, um, you know, a kind of undifferentiated simplicity uh, in, in, a, in, a, in the caricatured sense of the term, well then no, it, it isn't compatible with Scotus. But pure act just means that God is perfect existence. He is perfectly himself. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's that's compatible with any orthodox thinker on any side of the discussion. God is God. That's simply an identity statement. Um, email asks, do we participate with divinity directly in the Eucharist? Well, I think so, sure, because it contains the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Um, <clears throat> Clearly, uh, the, the, the energies of the Holy Spirit, the divine grace, is, is operating in and through in a particularly intense and realistic way in, in Holy Communion. So I would say, well, we participate with divinity directly in the Eucharist in, in probably the most perfect form, at least in terms of uh, uh, sacramental ministries of the church. That's, that would seem to make sense. All right. Um, I don't know if there was more built into that question. No, I don't see anything else. Um, well, actually, I think he might have a follow-up. How does one develop a direct relationship with God in the absolute divine simplicity framework? How do we participate directly with God in the Eucharist? I think, I think why he's asking this is because he believes that created grace somehow uh, puts a barrier between us and God in the Eucharist. <clears throat> Yeah, um, created grace just simply is a statement that uh, God's activities really do terminate in something real that is not God. Created grace is just simply the effect of God's uncreated grace terminating in a creature, modifying that creature to the extent that that grace operates on and within that creature. And it becomes, it can become a habitual um, state of affairs. But uh, created grace doesn't uh, exclude uncreated grace. Uh, there's a distinction in Bonaventure that's very uh, important. Created grace insofar as it um, modifies the habits and lifestyle and mode of operation of a Christian, well, that just simply re refers to the effects, the effects, the, the effects that happen to terminate in me, for example. You know, obviously I can't become cre uh, uncreated. So there's going to be a created effect. That created effect is called created grace. Uh, and it can be habitual, and it can, or it could be punctuated or sporadic. Um, <clears throat> uh, uncreated grace is simply the, the source of God operating through appropriation to the Spirit. We appropriate grace to the Spirit. We say the Spirit, the Spirit of grace, the Spirit operates, right? Well, the Spirit then is the source of grace terminating again in a creature that has an effect we call created grace. 
But the spirit himself, in terms of the gift of union, is the uncreated gift or uncreated grace. The fact that we're, the, the spirit is operating with respect to a creature and creates this relationship, this interpersonal relationship with a creature, that's, that's uncreated grace and the uh, gift of the spirit. The absolute divine simplicity framework, well, I, I, again, any kind of robust uh, sound articulation, and I think uh, the scotistic uh, articulation or the polymite articulation is perhaps the most helpful in explaining participation through those concepts of energies. Uh, in terms of uh, origination, termination, in terms of simple perfections, pure perfections, uh, that's helpful for explaining how participation can occur and how we can understand it. Uh, if if you mean uh, a Thomistic framework, they have resources and strategies for explaining this. But you know the the ADS framework is 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 something common in the most generic sense to all Christians because again we say God is not compounded. God is a mystery that exceeds our comprehension, and God is um, fully himself. There never is a time where God is not himself. There, God has always been himself without any imperfection. And did you use the term created divinity? I think he's asking for clarification on that too. You created what? I'm sorry. Created divinity. I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, that would be, that would just again be the, 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 the common term is theosis or divinization. Hmm. I don't think I used created divinity because I okay. don't know exactly what that means. But if you mean participation in its supernatural spiritual mode, that's called divinization mm -hmm. or theosis. Yeah. Um, last one from uh, Elijah. Uh, he asks, um, are the preternatural gifts of integrity and infused knowledge that Mary received flow from her role as mother of God? Or do they flow from her immaculate conception? Well, this is, this is a good question. And there's a great deal of debate on... What you, what you take as the first principle of Mariology, uh, debated for centuries by, by Mariologists and people very interested in this question. But I think in some sense, what one must distinguish between is the, um, <clears throat> the order of execution and the order of finality, and then the order of formal perfection and grace and the order of the purpose for that grace. Now, um, Obviously, Mary exists for the sake of Christ. So in the order of intention, Mary exists because she is predestined to be Theotokos. And so because of her dignity as being predestined to be Theotokos, she is all holy. So we'd say the preternatural gifts in order of final causality, because of the purpose, would flow from her status of divine maternity. But in terms of the, the actual procession and operation of the preternatural gifts, well, this would be a result of her personal sanctification as immaculate, right? So you see then the formal or efficient justification for the preternatural gifts would be the immaculate conception. But the final cause or the purpose of the immaculate conception and these gifts would be the divine maternity. Um, so in the order of intention, divine maternity, in the order of execution, the immaculate conception, in the order of effect, divine maternity, in the order of the personal perfection and grace, the immaculate conception. Okay. And so uh, you, 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 yeah, go ahead. No, no, uh, go ahead and finish up there. Well, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I think you just have to distinguish between those two aspects of the one mystery, because clearly Mary is always to be understood in terms of her um, status as immaculate because of the divine maternity. And obviously she is divine mother in some sense, because she was already pre-purified as immaculate. Excellent. Dr. Goff, this has been a pleasure. We're right at two hours. I, I know we probably wore you out. <laughs> I appreciate you so much. Thank you for coming on and doing this. Your, your time is truly valuable to us. You are a wealth of knowledge. You are always welcome on this show. I'd love to have you on again. Well, th thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what Father Christian has to say, because he knows the yes. uh, Greek texts. Better than I do. So yeah, that, this was a good challenge for me. Looking forward to that. And I'm still trying to organize a round table with you and Dr. Bradshaw and, and another Thomas. So uh, okay. that's still forthcoming. Well, give me a give me a a, a good warning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I will. Well in advance. Absolutely. Okay. Again, thank you for coming sure. on. Everybody, please comment, like, subscribe, share this material on your social media. Thank you all for watching. God bless you all.